The following audio is from Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you. We consider the time of year that it is that we get to celebrate the true meaning of Christmas, Emmanuel, God with us, the great mystery of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ, come to this earth as a baby. What a remarkable thing it is. And in light of the passage that we're going to go through this morning, what a truly remarkable thing that it is. I pray that you would bless this time, Father, this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And at this time I would invite the four- and five-year-olds to be dismissed to your class, and for the rest of you, if you have your Bibles, you can open to the book of Colossians, and we're going to be in Colossians chapter 2. I think a, a lot of churches uh, in the West, in North America, around this time of year pause, and they uh, take time to dig into passages that are maybe a little bit more Christmas-focused, uh, but for this passage this morning, and when I realized that I was going to get the opportunity to preach on this date here in December, uh, my mind was pretty resolutely made up that what we need as a church, as a congregation, as a body of Christ, is to just continually hear the Word of God, preached systematically, verse by verse. And so I said in our prayer this morning, but I will say it again, in light of the passage that we're going to go through this morning and how it describes the Lord Jesus Christ, It is a staggering thing to think of all of the wisdom and the knowledge of God when we consider Emmanuel with God with us and Christ coming as a baby. Maybe to begin, a little context is necessary. It's been some time since we've been in the book of Colossians, but just as a really quick way of review, in Colossians 1, we went through the fact that Paul addressed the letter to the church in Colossae and the churches in the surrounding area, and he was, by and large, encouraged by them, that they were seemingly doing what they were called to do. They were doing a good job, that he was encouraged by their faith, love, and hope. He was encouraged by how they were interacting with one another. The gospel had come to this region and they had believed and now they were bearing fruit. There was evidence that they were faithful, authentic Christ followers. Then as we move on in chapter 1 to do this quickly, we get to the portion of scripture that Pastor Dan read this morning, which is just an absolute symphony of praise about the deity and the majesty of Jesus Christ. It's hard to think of another passage in Scripture that so succinctly yet so beautifully describes the Savior that we worship. But now at the beginning of chapter 2, and we're going to pause and take some great time here to be completely honest with you. I'm not sure that the next time I come up to preach in the book of Colossians that I actually won't come back here to this section, verse 1 to 5. But that as we begin chapter 2 now, Paul is going to turn his attention directly to the reason for the letter. That he's addressing the false teachers and specifically what they are trying to teach to the Colossian church, how they are trying to lead them astray. And we see here in chapter 2 that the tone of the letter actually it changes. That there's a shift that takes place and there's a sense of urgency in Paul's words as he now addresses the Colossian church. And so let's read the text together. It should be on the screen in front of you. This is Colossians chapter 2 and we'll read verse 1 to 5. Paul says this, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Jesus Christ. This is the word of our Lord this morning, and may he bless the reading of it. So we see here at the beginning of chapter 2 that Paul is addressing the great conflict 
that is going on within the Apostle Paul and that he is experiencing. The word here in the original language actually, when, when translated literally, is this idea that, that Paul is actually agonizing over the church in Colossians. That there's this deep struggle or conflict that is going on within. And why is that the place? Well, the, the reality is, is that there is a great conflict going on in the church in Colossae. That there's actually a, a battle taking place. I think that once you, you kind of read through the New Testament and you actually maybe view it with this particular lens, you can see that this is all throughout the New Testament and it continues through to this day, by the way. That there is a battle taking place, that there is ever a battle between good and evil. And so there's a battle raging here at Colossae, and Paul understands that it is imperative that the enemy be stopped here. Now you might say, well, why? Why, why here? Well, I think what Paul understands here is that this is not just a local matter. This is not something that's simply taking place in this one little church in the town of Colossae. But that this is something that has far-reaching effects. And that maybe, just maybe, if it's not happening in other places right now, like it is happening in Colossae, that someday soon this will be coming up as well. And it will need to be dealt with. This is why Paul, although he had never met the church in Colossae, nor seen them face to face, could make the battle of the Colossian church his own. He didn't know these people on a first name basis. He had never met them. He had never shaken their hand. He had never sat down to eat with them. And yet here he sits in prison and with whatever tools he has at his disposal, he says, okay, I'm going to gladly assume the responsibility of this church and I'm going to take it upon myself in whatever capacity I can to allow the God of the universe to work through me so that God's church, Christ's church, can be built. As a quick aside, and I will try not to do too many of these this morning, but as a quick aside to the men in the room, this is a tremendous example of what masculinity should look like. That here is a problem that is not necessarily in Paul's own backyard, and yet he feels the responsibility for this church. He understands the danger and the peril that they are in. And he gladly assumes sacrificial responsibility. He pours out of himself for the good of those around him. That is a definition, that is an example of what godly masculinity should look like. Paul understood that the battle was taking place here in Colossae, but it was a battle that was going to be, if not already, fought all over the Christian world you might recognize and see that this battle wasn't maybe the same flavor in every single church around that Paul dealt with, but it was, it was certainly different in different places. But you know what? The heart of the battle here was that false teachers were taking away from the majesty, from the lordship of Jesus Christ and his gospel alone in the Colossian church. And Paul was going to confront it and deal with it. We too must recognize that there is a battle ranging all around us today. And to be honest with you, in light of the first five, six verses here that we're going to tackle this morning in Colossians, I'm probably going to spend more time on this first verse than I should in light of the entirety of the passage. But I'm going to with good reason. Pastorally, as I was thinking about this this week, I really think that this is a point that is under the radar, but yet incredibly important for us here today. That we cannot see the problem and the fight that was going on in the church of Colossae over Gnosticism and the the believers in Colossae being tempted to, to drift away from the gospel and not think that that is something that will not happen here today. We are a people in the West today that have been lulled to sleep. We are a people that have no idea that the front line of this very battle is quite literally taking place in this room this morning amongst all of us. That there is ever a temptation to drift away from the gospel and that the forces of evil are working extremely hard to pull us away from the lordship and the majesty and the sole preeminence of Jesus Christ in our life. Beloved, we must, we must understand that. And we must remember that. I've been reminded lately that we have grown up in an age when we've been indoctrinated into, I think, what you can maybe call a a, a materialist worldview. So I know that's maybe a a philosophical term, but but the the gist of it, or or maybe kind of the the dumbed-down version of it, is this, 
is that really all that we see and that we can touch in this world is all that there is. That the world is just made up of matter, that even maybe the, the abstract thoughts that we can have are just the, the, the result of matter interacting with matter in our brain and it causes us to think the way that we do. I have taken a self-assessment of myself with the education that I have in the world that I've lived in, what, have, what I've been exposed to, and I have realized that I have been far too quick to reject anything that I can't see and touch with my hands. But the reality is that this is not at all what we read in Scripture, that this is not at all true. That there are forces of good and evil, of light and of darkness, that are are battling against one another in unseen realms that we cannot tangibly, from a materialist perspective, see and, and touch. But that it is going on, and that it is very, very real. Now, the the the... Um, danger of this is, is maybe to, to look at everything around you and just label it as demonic. And I'm, I'm not advocating that we do that this morning. But what I am advocating and what we need to understand is that the world is not just all stuff. That there are spirits at work in this world today and we must, I would suggest more than any other place in the world, we must be aware of this. Because in the West, we are not. We are not. And do with that, do with that what you will. But that is a tremendously important point this morning for our congregation. We must realize what Scripture says in this area. And I have a few verses here. I don't think I'm going to get to all of them because I've probably taken longer than I should have already in this particular point. But let's take a look here at what 1 Peter 5.8 says. It says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That is terrifying. That is a terrifying verse. I don't know about you, but I understand and I recognize my need to abide and stay very close to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I do not want to stray away and be an easy target for my adversary. Because he is powerful. In 1 John chapter 4, and I'll maybe skip a little bit past and and just look at verse 3 here. It says this. It says, in every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Beloved, there are spirits of evil that are here and they are after us, that the front line of the battle is here. One last one quickly and we will move on. In Ephesians 6, the the famous well-known passage of spiritual warfare. It says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. It then goes on to say, Take up the whole armor of God that you will be able to withstand. What I'm trying to say this morning is this, is that God does not leave us unprepared for this. He certainly does not. Ephesians 6 here is clear that he gives us the armor that we need to stand in the day of adversity. But brother and sister in Christ, what we must understand this morning, and this is a tremendous point of application, is that we are in a day of adversity. That there is a battle taking place here and we must have our eyes open to the fact that that is the case. We live in an embattled world. Paul was engaged in this battle against the principalities quite literally wherever he went. Wherever Paul went, there was conflict. We see riots in Ephesus. We see beatings in Philippi. Stoning in Lystra. We see shipwreck at sea. Paul Paul saw, and I think he rightly understood, that there was danger everywhere. Paul reveals the intensity of this struggle in 2 Corinthians 1.8 when he says, For we do not want to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Think about what he's saying there. Paul is engaged in a battle. Paul was engaged struggle, or he was struggled day and night to not be a burden to anyone. He struggled to present the gospel. He struggled against character attacks from the various churches that he was looking after. But the great conflict here and the great struggle that Paul is talking about in Colossians 2 verse 1 is not just a physical struggle. Most of all, he wrestled for his people, even the people he had never met 
through prayer. Another tremendous point of application this morning. We're going to be going application all the way through. We must understand that we live in an embattled world. We must understand that the best weapon that we have against this is going to the Lord in prayer. There's immediate application here. Pastors, the pastors that you have at this church, that we devote ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayer, that we spend time in our week going through the directory and praying for you. That in the spiritual battle that you are engaged in in your week, whether you know it or not, we are in prayer for you. And that God would strengthen you and give you what you need to be obedient to Christ in your week. Members of the same flock, it's a b- glorious thing to see prayer meetings here happen every week. It's a glor- even more glorious thing to understand that, that when those individuals go home, and I, I'm sure countless others in this congregation as well, That when they are at home in the quiet and the sanctuary of their own room, that they are in prayer for other members of this church. It's a beautiful thing. What about parents, though? Parents, do we pray for our children? Do we pray for our children like Paul prays for his spiritual children here in Colossians 2? That we understand that there is a great battle taking place, that quite literally your kids, as they go to school during the day, are on the front lines of that battle. Do we pray for them? that their hearts may be guarded, that they would one day see the truth and the beauty of Jesus Christ? Husbands and wives, do we pray for one another? Husbands, do you pray for your wives? Do you guard them? Do you protect them? Wives, do you pray for your husbands? They are going to have to give an account one day before God for your spiritual condition and the spiritual spiritual condition of their children? Do you pray for them? Do you pray that God would strengthen them to give them what they need to walk through what they have to on a daily basis? There's tremendous application here in verse 1, and I know it's not the meat of the passage, and I could spend much more time here, and I agonize here, but it's so important to see that Paul is making the point that we are in a battle that the best weapon that we have against the forces of evil in that battle is to get on our knees and to pray before the God of the universe that he would strengthen us so that, and as we move into the rest of this passage, Paul reveals the purpose of this is, is that the believers in Colossae would become mature in Christ. That they would become mature in Christ. That they would grow up into spiritual maturity. Certainly this doesn't happen overnight. But over time, through the preaching of God's word, through the fellowship of believers, through getting on our knees in prayer, through the Holy Spirit teaching us as we get into the word, that we can be built up into a more mature believer in Jesus Christ. And so from here, Paul gives us the marks of maturity as we move through the rest of this passage here this morning in Colossians 2. He says that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love. Isn't that a beautiful thing? I have this image of my grandmother when I was very young, and I would sit on her lap and I would watch her knit. And to this day, I had no idea how she did that. She would give it to me and I would try it and it would just, it just would not make sense. It would not make sense. I have some sort of recollection of the Dressler boys taking knitting class. Is that? Greg and Andy. Greg and Andy. Okay, very good. Maybe you guys could help me afterwards and figure out how that actually happened. But this idea here of being knit together. David, do you like how I left you out of that? Yeah, that's good. We have this idea here of being knit together in love. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. We cannot unravel our lives from the believers that are in Christ around us. That there's no such thing as this lone ranger Christianity, which by and large is being advertised wholesale in our our culture today. Right, That we can you know, have our time in our Bible, we can listen, listen to our worship music, we can do what suits and fits us, but that the people around us are not actually necessary to walk through this Christian life with. That is not biblical. We see here that Paul is saying that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love. We see here again the, the picture and the principle that we come from so many different backgrounds, but we all share the same common bond. And that is our identity is in Jesus Christ. That we are saved by his blood. That love for one another is the defining mark 
of a Christian. Pastor Dressler just went through 1 John a little while ago, and he hit that again and again and again. 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. That that is a defining mark of who a Christian is, that we are to be a people that are knit together in love. The world does not have a category for this. The world cannot understand this. The world seems to enjoy the idea of love when it's convenient for them or they can love people that are like them and they love being around people that are like them. They love being around people that that, uh, serve a purpose for them. But this is not this idea of Christian love. The idea of Christian love here is this idea that if I understand that I'm a child of God, if I understand that Christ has died for me, that he loved me so much to do that, then I am then going to pour that love out on those around me and then I'm going to sacrifice and I'm going to serve them. It's a beautiful thing and the world does not have a category for it. It does not make sense apart from a supernatural working of God. We see evidence of this in Scripture. How can Simon the Zealot walk alongside Matthew the tax collector? (laughs) If you know your history, that does not make sense. How can... Mary Magdalene and all of her past associate with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and they coexist with such harmony. Certainly not all the time, certainly not perfectly, but they do. They walk together, rough edges and all, right? How can so many different denominations be represented in this room right now, and we can all do life together and not bite each other's heads off? I know you may want to do that sometime, But the gospel suggests that, hey, I'm going to take that thought, I'm going to put it aside, and I'm going to love that person because Christ chose to love me when I was in full, utter rebellion to him. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. And so why does Paul endure such a great conflict? Well, that the people of Colossae would be built up, maturing in their faith, and a defining mark of this is that they would be knit together in love. The next mark that Paul speaks to here, and it's one that we could spend many, many Sundays on, is that they would attain to the riches of full understanding. That they would attain to the riches of full understanding. And certainly we can go on, and maybe I'll even read a little bit more of that here. In verse uh, 2, that they would uh, attain to all the riches of full uh, fullness, full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. Paul agonizes here over the Colossians so that they would attain to all the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge and mystery of God. Without assurance, the believer cannot enjoy all the blessings that God has for him or her in this life. Do you understand that? That there is a understanding that we can have assurance in the finished work of Christ. But that if we don't have that assurance, we are missing out on so many of the blessings that God has for us. If I am constantly doubting the fact that Jesus Christ has saved me by his blood, then how can I fix my eyes upon the eternal things where I am going to sit at the foot of Christ, feet of Christ forever, and worship and praise him? Now, I'm not in any way, shape, or form knocking people that go through times of doubt in their salvation. I think that to a certain extent, all of us will at a time, doubt the things that are said and spoken of in Scripture. But that that's not where we should always be. That we should be able to understand an assurance because of what God has done through Jesus Christ. Now, here we get to the heart of the Colossian heresy. That there was a mix of things, and scholars are not all agreed on exactly what was taking place in Colossae, but it's most likely a a, a jumble of things, and really it's centered around this idea of, of Gnosticism. And this happens again and again and again and again. But this idea of Gnosticism was that this belief in Christ, that the gospel that Paul had certainly seen the, the Colossians believe, repent, and put their faith in Christ through, that it was not enough. That there was a special knowledge or maybe even a higher knowledge that was needed to actually have your soul saved. And so you can see Gnosticism as it plays out here in Colossae. You can see Gnosticism as it plays out in far many other locations in the New Testament. But we understand this is not something that originated in the New Testament. It's not something that originated today. It's something that is as old as the garden itself. 
In Genesis 3, in verse 4 to 5, it reads this. It says, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day, in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. <laughs> See how ancient this is? This idea that you don't need to be satisfied or content with the understanding that you have, that there's actually a higher level of understanding that you should strive for that is available to you. And if you go there, then you will have a full understanding, a full assurance that you can be in union with the God of the universe. Now, certainly Gnosticism is deeper than that, and we could get into the the specifics of the theology there, but I'm not going to take time to do that this morning. But needless to say, this Gnosticism that Paul was battling here was something that was very, very old indeed. It was a tool of the serpent from long, long ago. The Gnostics at Colossae claimed that they had a secret. They claimed that they had a hidden set of knowledge and understanding, a mystery that would enlighten the Colossians to a more full understanding of God. This may be the form of the gospel plus Jewish legalism. Maybe the gospel plus asceticism. The gospel plus circumcision in order for salvation to to be a reality. We see also here in Colossae this idea of the worship of angels. But Paul hits the nail on the head here when he suggests, and he makes overwhelmingly clear again and again and again to the Colossians, that the Gnostics are saying that they have a secret that will allow you to attain a fuller understanding of God but that the true secret was actually already revealed by God in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That when it speaks of a mystery, that Jesus Christ is that mystery. That from ages and ages ago, in fact, from the very beginning, even just a little bit farther than what we read in uh, Genesis 3 and 4 and 5, but in Genesis 3.15, that as sin entered the world, that God actually promised that one day from the seed of the woman, one would rise to crush the head of the serpent. That this is the beginning of this mystery that is foretold, that it is foretold all through the Old Testament. That the prophets again and again and again spoke of one who would come and he would liberate the Jews from their enemy. We see it all throughout the Old Testament. And yet what no one could see, but what we have the such distinct privilege of seeing from the full revelation of the Word of God is that that mystery was the person in the work of Jesus Christ. And that he would not come as the Jews foresaw as a conquering hero, this majestic figure that would come down and would crush the heads of the Romans and that the Jews would be liberated and everything would be okay. But that Jesus Christ would come down and in the beauty and the majesty of what we see at Christmas, that the knowledge and wisdom of God would be a a human baby. Beloved, think about that. I had an opportunity to do a chapel at the Christian school a number of years ago, and it coincided with uh, my second son, Remy, being a baby. And it was was just wonderful timing. And we were going through the names of Jesus Christ, and we were going through, and I wanted them to get the understanding that That Christ, in all of his majesty, in all of the wisdom of God, came down as a human baby. And so I I got this little baby seat, and I set it in front of them on the stage. And Stacy was behind stage, and she handed me Remy, and Remy came out. And as babies do, he was flailing all over the place, and he couldn't control himself. And I sat him down in this little seat that was structured enough so that he could actually sit up, but that's about all he could do. He was still drooling, he was still throwing up, he was still doing all of the things that babies do. Remy, I apologize that I'm embarrassing you a little bit this morning. But what I wanted them to see is that that is how our Messiah came. Think about that. That we're talking about all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and we're talking about the Messiah humbling himself, stepping out of the perfection of heaven to become that. That he was entirely dependent on his fallible human mother in the early years of his life. That if he fell over, that there was nothing he could do to get himself back up again. That he had to learn obedience. That he had to be a toddler. That he had to grow into a a young boy. That he had to grow into a young man. That he had to learn and that he had to attain in wisdom. And yet he did all of this perfectly. 
that he submitted himself to the will and the authority of human parents. And that as he grew and as he grew into a man, he understood that he was there for one singular mission, which was to carry out the will of not his human parents, but his heavenly father. And then in the humility of of all of it, he submitted himself perfectly to that. That at about 30 years of age, he began his ministry, that he collected this ragtag bundle of nobodies, and that he taught them the hidden treasures and the majesty of what was God was doing on this stage of human history. Again, think about that. All the treasures of knowledge and wisdom. Christ, a full understanding of what he is doing, and he's pouring it out on, not on, on the, the, the spiritual impressive ones in society, but on these fishermen. And then in all of that, as his time on earth comes to a close, and he has a full understanding about what is going to take place, that as he kneels down in the garden, as he's quite literally sweating drops of blood, that he cries out to his father and says, Father, take this cup from me, let it pass. But then he has the audacity to speak the words in full obedience, in perfection, in righteousness, in beauty, not your will be done. Not my will be done, but your will be done. And in perfect humility and obedience, he understands his necessity to go to the cross, to lay himself down, and to die for the sins of not men and women who adored him, but men and women that were in full and utter rebellion to him. That as he was being nailed to the cross, the only thing, we just went through James 3 with the tongue and the power of the tongue and how it reveals what's in our heart. And as he's being nailed to the cross, the only thing that comes out of the Messiah's mouth is, Father, forgive them because they know not what they're doing. That all he had for these people that were nailing him to the cross was love and pity and a desire that they would repent and see who he was and what God was doing on the grand stage of human history. And so a mature believer realizes the spiritual riches that we have in Christ. He realizes that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Jesus. And a mature believer pursues an ever-increasing understanding of this. That as we read the Word of God, the Spirit of God teaches us and we come to greater understanding of the mystery of what God has done through Christ. This is Paul's prayer for the Colossians. And this is our prayer for Maple City today. In Christ is all the treasure and the wisdom. It's a remarkable statement that all wisdom and treasure is found in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. This right here is about as direct of an attack on the Gnostic believers as you can get. Right? They're preaching this special knowledge that we need. We need this special level of understanding. Paul says, no. All we need is Jesus Christ. Just look to Jesus Christ. And so this is another immediate point of application for us today That Christian maturity involves recognizing that the treasures and wisdom of God, all the treasures of wisdom of God, are found in Christ. They're not found in a university. They're certainly not found in the news. They're not found in a philosophy. They're not found in an impressive political figure. They're not found in an impressive philosopher. They're not found in Jordan Peterson. They're not found in Joe Rogan. They're not found in Elon Musk. They're not found in your favorite preacher or your favorite Bible study. They are found in the person of Jesus Christ, and that is where we must always stay. We must always stay at the foot of the cross in the person and the work of Christ. You see, this is not high tower theology that doesn't have any sort of application on the road, but this is actually rubber meets the road, practical theology that we understand that Jesus Christ is the wisdom and the majesty of God. You see, once you see start to see Christ in this way, it will fuel you to pers- persevere and to be obedient in the things that God calls you to be obedient in. That as we read through and as we understand the full brevity of Colossians 1 and 15 to 20 this morning, as we read or as Pastor Dan read before, that this knowledge of who Christ is and what God has done through him 
will actually practically work out in our lives by compelling us to be obedient to him. That in raising our children, that in serving the unlovely around us, that the fact that God is, or Christ is the image of the invisible God, he's the firstborn over all creation, that he was there in creation itself, that he's before all things, and in him all things consist that he's the head of the church, that he's the firstborn of the dead, and that in all things, he would have preeminence. That is not just something that stays here, but it's something that actually connects to our heart, and then it compels us to live out the gospel to those around us. This should change the way that we do everything. This should change the way that we prepare a supper time meal. This should change the way that we talk to our children. This should change the way that we devote ourselves to what is said in Scripture, that unlike the Jews who were under, trying to understand what Jesus Christ was doing, that we have the full picture of what God has done. And so that if we need to be kindled in this direction, we only need to go here. We need to open our Bible. We need to get to Colossians 1 and verse 15 or a host of other passages in the New Testament. We need to sit ourselves down. We need to pray, Spirit of God, teach me that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. That I don't need to go anywhere else to understand the wisdom and the knowledge of God, that it is in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, when we stay here and when we stay with Christ, we are not tempted to follow every wind of doctrine. And there are a lot of winds of doctrine in this world today, like there were in first century Colossae. But we're not tempted to follow every wind of doctrine. When we stay here, we are compelled to love those around us and we are compelled to not squabble about trifles in this life that are not important. We must remember that at this church, that we have grown tremendously as a church, that God has blessed this place, that we have a lot of people and by God's grace, we are so unbelievably thankful that you are here. But that we are a church that is only concerned about the gospel of Jesus Christ about what the Word of God says, and that we are willing to set tertiary things aside in order that we focus on the gospel. By God's grace, that is why this church made it through COVID the way that it did. When all of the wildness of the opinions and the craziness of everything was going on, that we were, by God's grace and His grace alone, able to just focus on what the Word of God said and put everything else secondary to that. And that there is where we must stay. So Paul rejoices to see the good order of the steadfastness of the faith of the Colossians. As Paul says these things, he is still agonizing for the Colossians that they would not be led away by persuasive words. But as we have seen, that if we stay at the foot of the cross, if we stay with Christ, then that is a great defense to us that we would not be persuaded away. But there's a charge here for us, and I think it's a tremendous point of application, and I want to get to it in closing here. The deception of the enemy at Colossae was lies. Is that a deception that the enemy tries to deal with us today as well? Yes. Absolutely it is. We understand that there are so many winds of doctrine. We understand that there are so many differings of opinions. We are so understanding that because of the internet and everything that we have available to us, that there are tremendous dangers out there in terms of false teaching that we must stay with what the Word of God says in order to be guarded and kept safe from those things. But as I was reading in Colossians this week, and I was, I was, I was again considering and, and reading much of the, the context of the book of Colossians, we have to remember that the letter was of, of Colossians was not just written to the church in Colossae. That it was actually written to other churches as well. That it was certainly addressed to the Colossians, but it was meant to be, to be read in the churches that were in the surrounding area as well. And one of those churches was the church in Laodicea, or Laodicea. The deception of the enemy in Laodicea was not necessarily focused on lies, but it was focused on wealth and prosperity. I'm sure lies were present but it was focused on wealth and prosperity. 
Now, church, hear me out, and please don't at this point check out, because I think that this is so important for us. When we come to a passage of Scripture, and this makes itself known, we cannot ignore it. The church in Laodicea, its downfall was wealth and prosperity. Now, why do we know that, and how does this apply to us? Well, let's answer that by turning to the book of Revelation chapter 3. If you know your Bible, you know this passage. And you also know how terrifying it is. And in light of the wealth and the prosperity that we enjoy today in the West. And listen, I know that things are getting tighter. I know that things are getting more expensive. I know that that the standard of living in Canada is possibly declining and will maybe not get back to what we have seen today. But believer in Christ, consider what we have. Consider what we have relative to other brothers and sisters in Christ around the world that quite literally give their lives to have a Bible that is in tatters. That on my desk in there, I have the privilege of having five or six Bibles open when I study to make sure that I am doing justice to the text. We are a wealthy people. And so while certainly there is lies that the devil is trying to sow here and that we need to be aware of, Look at what the church in Laodicea struggled with. And look at what it says in Revelation 3, 14 to 17. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. Verse 15. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing, and do do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. It's a pretty graphic area of scripture by all means. It's a pretty terrifying area of scripture. But Maple City, what I want us to understand today is that when we consider the context of the book of Colossians being read to the church in Colossae, but then when we also understand the context that the church or the letter of Colossians was also written to the Laodiceans, and that the Laodiceans' problem in the end of all things was not that they were led away by false teaching in terms of a lie, but that they were led away by their prosperity and their wealth. That that is a terrifying thing that I don't think any of us, as it says here in Revelation, would actually admit that we were led astray because of our wealth. In verse 16, you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I'm not sure any of us would say this, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. Certainly I don't think that we would admit that with our lips, but how much and do we admit it with our hearts and our minds? That we live our lives from Monday to Saturday with the understanding that I have enough prosperity, I have enough wealth to keep myself secure and that I really don't actually need to stay at the foot of Jesus Christ like this passage instructs me to. This is a terrifying thing and this is something that we must be guarded against Notice here at the start of this letter, and this would also have applied to the Laodiceans, is that Paul is encouraged by the steadfastness of their faith in Christ. And yet we get to the book of Revelation in the end, and we see the history that comes in the middle, and we see that the Laodiceans were eventually led away by their wealth and their prosperity. And so we must heed that warning. Whether it be in the form of Gnosticism, (laughs) or whether it be in the form of wealth and prosperity, where we just don't need this Lord Jesus Christ, like Colossians 2 suggests we do, we must heed the warning and understand our necessity to stay at the wisdom and treasure and majesty of Jesus Christ. See, brothers and sisters of Christ, there's a simplicity here. But there's a beauty in this simplicity, and we see it again and again and again in Scripture. That we are not to look outside of or away from Jesus Christ. For those of you who know me, I I love to read. I don't get enough time to read the things that I would love to read. I have a lot of reading for school, but I I love to read. And one of my favorite authors is C.S. Lewis. He was just an absolute master at communicating in a way that was succinct and beautiful and creative. And I want to close by 
revealing to you a, a uh, communication that he had with a, a very young girl that was, it, it took place just a, a couple weeks before he died. And I want you to see the simplicity here <laughs> in the innocence of how he communicates to such a young child, but how much relevance it has for us today in its simplicity. He says this. I almost said, Dear Willow. It's not Willow. Dear Ruth, many thanks for your kind letter. And it was very good of you to write and to tell me that you like my books. And what a good letter you wrote for your age. If you continue to love Jesus, nothing much can go wrong with you. And I hope that you may always do just that. Think about the simplicity of one of the great theologians of our age, one of the great writers, the literary masters of our age, in how he communicates here to a little girl. And yet, how much relevance there is for somebody of the age of, what, maybe six, seven? But it also has relevance for all of us. That if we continue to love Jesus, if we continue to never leave the majesty of Jesus, if we continue to see the preeminence of Jesus in all things and in all areas of our life, then nothing much wrong can go wrong, can go wrong with us or can happen to us. And so Maple City, continue to love Jesus. Continue to step into the riches of full assurance of understanding. And continue to see the treasures of wisdom and knowledge only in Jesus Christ. And if we do that, tarry the Lord's coming. For generations hence, there will be a family of believers in this place that will continue to be faithful to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that at this time of year, we can consider and understand the great mystery that was the God of heaven and his son, Jesus Christ, stepping out of the perfection of heaven to the most humble of beginnings possible. And that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge were found in this baby that was both fully God and fully human. We could spend eternity just thinking about that, and may we do so. May we never leave the full scope of what Christ has done. And may we always return to the cross, to the foot of the cross, to see who we are in light of it, to see the beauty and the truth of the gospel, to repent, to put our faith in him and him alone, and to live our lives obedient to him. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you would like to learn more about what you've just heard or are interested in the ministry of Maple City, please visit our website at maplecitybaptistchurch.com.